Okay, so I taste a liquor never brewed by Emily Dickinson. And remember now that liquor is strong alcohol. Okay, its spirits would be whiskey, rum, etc. All right. So before reading the poem, I asked you to think and write down a quick answer for each question. The first one being, can the weather make us happy? The answer was an overwhelming yes from the class. What do you associate with a hot, sunny summer's day? List at least 10 things. Try to include things that appeal to your sense of smell, hearing and taste. So we got beaches, ice cream, sun, flowers, swimming, work, heat, camping, uh, birds calling, kids screaming and the smell of a barbecue. Um, floating through the air. Okay, so you were well able to make that connection between your senses and a hot sunny summer's day. Then we read through the poem. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the vats upon the rhyme yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of the air am I and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more, till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. Good homework, I asked you to figure out what's going on in the poem. Tip one was go verse by verse. Tip two was read at least three times. And this now is a skill that we need to develop for the unseen poetry section. And the hint that I gave you was I taste a liquor never brewed. That liquor that she's tasting is the joy of a beautiful day. So, summary. First stanza. The poet tells us that she drinks an alcoholic drink that has never been brewed. Now, it is that process of brewing and of fermentation that makes the drink alcoholic. So, it is impossible to drink an alcoholic drink that has never been brewed. And if something is impossible, it is a paradox. Okay? So, how can you drink something that has not been made? That's a paradox. Okay, so the poem is starting off very strangely. She tells us that she's drinking the beer from glasses that have been scooped in pearl. This could refer to the foaming head of um, bubbles on top of a glass of beer, possibly. Okay, or it could refer to the light shining off of glass. Okay, or it could refer to clouds up in the sky. Okay, the very, very tall clouds, or not the very tall clouds, the very high cirrus clouds that are swirling around the sky on a hot summer's day. She says this drink tastes better than anything that has ever been brewed in the Rhine. And the Rhine is an area of Germany that is famous for its beer. That should not be there for its beer and its white wines as well. So she's telling us that this alcohol that's never been brewed tastes better than the alcohol that's produced in the Rhine, which is famous for its alcohol. OK, so that first verse seems to be a complete paradox. All right. Second verse. The poet is drunk on the sweet summer air. So inebriate of the air am I. She's inebriate. She's drunk on the air and she is drunk on the dew, debauchee of dew. And she's reeling. She's stumbling drunkenly through glorious summer's days. And those glorious summer's days are inns of molten blue. And the uh, image below us is a visual definition of the word reeling. OK. Stanza three. The drunk bee is kicked out of the foxglove. The butterflies swear never to drink again. They renounce their drams. They renounce their drinking cups. Uh, however, the poet chooses to drunkenly and defiantly keep on drinking. So she's like, when the bees kicked out, when the butterflies say that they're going to take the pledge, they're never going to drink anymore. I'm going to drink more. And this verse ends with an exclamation mark, which adds a sense of exuberance, exuberance being excitement and energy and drunken bravado, as in uh, everybody's stopping drinking. And she's like, no, I won't drink more. OK, and it ends with that exclamation mark, which is adding that sense of joy, that sense of excitement, that sense of energy. Um, on a side note, uh, while I was researching this poem, it turns out that bees can actually get drunk on a hot day. Uh, the nectar inside sunflowers can ferment. That's the process by which it's brewed, becomes alcoholic. If they come back to the hive drunk, the guards on the hive won't let them in until they sober up. And I have got a source to back it up. So I didn't make that up. OK, um, this was the Canberra Times in Australia. And it was the gardens around Parliament, apparently, were having a problem with bees that were drunk. <laughs> and they got someone in to investigate and they said, you know, it's fine. It's OK. The bees will be grand. Just leave them alone. OK. Stanza four. 
In the last verse, the poet seems to be in heaven. Okay, so at the bottom there, we have little angels gazing at something. These are the seraphs and the saints. The seraphs were the highest form of angels. And those seraphs and saints are gazing out of the windows. So they're running and they're waving out of the windows and waving their hats at her. We're told that the seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run. So they're running to look at her. Okay, she's making a spectacle of herself or possibly they're delighted to see her. But they're running to see her and they're looking at the little tippler, which is the poet. A tippler is somebody who drinks, leaning against the sun. The poem ends with a striking but playful image and another exclamation mark. Okay, now there is a suggestion that the seraphs and the saints are fascinated by her behaviour. Are they disapproving? Are they jealous that she can behave like this and they can't because they are saints and angels and she is human? So she can do things that they can't. Um, do they disapprove of her actions? Are they looking on at her and saying how terrible she is and how awful she is? OK, now it is a stretch. OK, it is a big stretch. But some people do argue that because this verse seems to be set in heaven and the angels and saints are looking at her, that the speaker in the poem has drunk herself to death. But that is a stretch. OK, you can argue it if this is what you think, but the poem to me seems to be too joyful for that. OK. Right. Themes. So the topic or the subject of the poem, that surface meaning is somebody talking about um, drinking a liquor, um, her inns of molten blue, the bees being kicked out, the butterflies giving up the drink and then the angels and the saints watching on, possibly in wonder, possibly in amusement, amusement possibly in jealousy and possibly in disapproval. OK, so the theme is nature and happiness that we're going with. It focuses on the joy a poet finds in nature. And this is a theme that a lot of poets would express okay? because poets often do find solace. They find comfort in nature. They find inspiration in nature. And here she's focusing on that joy that she feels. Um, on a beautiful summer's day and the poem is an extended metaphor so she uses the idea of being drunk as a metaphor to describe the effect that nature has on her okay so if you're using it as a metaphor she's not actually drunk it's a metaphor it's saying that something is something else okay she's basically saying I am so happy it's like I'm drunk she's drunk with joy on a beautiful summer's day she's basically high on life OK, so she's delighted with herself. It's an extended metaphor. Poetic devices. Again, we have um, Dickinson's usual use of images from nature. So the poem is replete with it's full of images from nature. We have got the glasses that have been scooped in pearl. We meet a drunken bee being kicked out of a foxglove. And I managed to find a picture of a bee in a foxglove. I'm very proud of that. Um, presumably for drunk and disorderly behaviour. The butterflies have turned over a new leaf. They've decided to take the pledge and never drink again. They've decided to never drink again. And the summer skies are described as being molten blue. It is a beautiful description of the deep, deep liquid blue of the clear sky in the summer. It's a molten blue. You kind of think of molten like molten silver, molten gold, something that's solid that has to be melted. It makes me think of lava as well, so it gets that heat in there. In of molten blue. Poetic devices then, moving on to her use of punctuation. So, as always, she uses her dashes. She uses her trademark dashes. However, in this poem, okay, we have seen that in I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died, it is somebody whose breath is failing them as they are passing on. Whereas in this poem, they're more like the pauses in a drunk person's speech. In the final verse, it's almost as though the poet or the speaker is falling asleep while speaking because they are so drunk, because they are so inebriated with summer, with nature, with this assault on their senses. And the dash after saints and before sun could represent this because it's a very random place to put a dash. Uh, and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. So it's like so she kind of forgets the end of her speech because she is so inebriated from this liquor that has never been brewed. She also uses exclamation marks in this poem. And the exclamation marks in the poem, they highlight, they underline the playful tone that the poet is using. It is a joyful poem. If you compare this poem to The Soul Has Bandaged Moments, they are very, very different in mood. OK, the only thing that would compare would be that middle verse 
where she dances like a bomb in the soul has bandaged moments but there's a sense of um manic activity to that whereas this poem is pure joy okay Sound effects. So sound effects, again, important in poems because of the word choice that poets deploy. Um, so again, she uses sibilance. Sibilance is the repetition of that S sound. The sibilance in the last verse adds a musical quality to the verse. It's a very hard one to say fast. We are told that seraphs swing their snowy hats and the saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. So she repeats that S sound throughout it. Um, if she were properly drunk, she wouldn't be able to pronounce it. Okay, so again, she's using the sound that she seems to love, possibly representing the wind through the trees of that beautiful summer's day. Okay. And she also uses alliteration, deboshi of dew. Um, so deboshi of dew is an example of alliteration. She's playing with language. A deboshi is someone who's corrupted by drink, who has had their morals corrupted, etc. Now, she could have expressed that in a thousand different ways. Okay, but deboshi of dew is an unusual way of expressing it. It's an unusual idea. Dew is the moisture that's left on the grass after the dawn. It's seen as something pure usually. So how can you be corrupted by something so pure? It's an unusual idea. And the alliteration there is actually drawing attention to that expression. Okay, so she could have expressed it in a thousand different ways. She chose to express it like this, to draw our attention to it. Hyperbole. So... She states that she's getting drunk on a liquor that's better than all the alcohol in the vats upon the Rhine. Now, the Rhine was famous for its alcoholic beverages and its over-exaggeration of this. She's over-exaggerating how wonderful this tastes and how great it feels. Okay, it is deliberate exaggeration. It is an example of hyperbole or hyperbole. And it starts the poem off in a playful tone with this brag or this joke. Pause and reflect. Question time. Would you agree that Dickinson uses hyperbole or hyperbole in this poem? If so, find an example apart from the example that I gave you in the previous slide. Describe in your own words the view of nature put forward in this poem. Is it a realistic view? Give reasons for your answer. List the poetic devices that Dickinson uses in this poem. What effect do these devices have on the reader? And that last one. Do you like the poem? Why or why not? Okay. And again, for that last one, please do back it up with reference to the poem. I like it because X, Y, Z, for example. And I don't like it because of this, for example. Okay. 